Hello, bonjour, konnichiwa, ni hao. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar entitled Autophagy from Fundamental Mechanism to Mechanical Stress in Physiology and Disease. Before we begin, I want to check that the audience can see the title slide. If you can't see it, please be sure you have flash enabled. My name is Darcy Miller, and I will be serving as your moderator for this webinar. I'm a product manager at Novus Biologicals, one of the Biotechni brands, and our featured speaker is Dr. Patrice Codonio. Dr. Codonio is a research director of the French Institute for Health and Medical Research and a group leader at the Institut Nicolas Enfant Maladies. He is also an honorary professor at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina and associate editor of the Autophagy Journal since it was established. His research is dedicated to studying the basic aspects of autophagy, including membrane dynamics, autophagy signaling, and the role of autophagy in the stress response to mechanical stress and cancer treatment. One of his most important contributions to the field of autophagy is from his 2000 Journal of Biological Chemistry paper with Fred Mayer in which they provided the first evidence for opposing roles for class 1 PI3K and class 3 PTD-INS3K in mammalian cells. Before handing over control to Dr. Coronio, I would like to make a brief announcement about the sponsor. Biotechni brings together the prestigious life science research brands of R&D Systems, Novus Biologicals, Tokris Bioscience, Protein Simple, and Advanced Cell Diagnostics to provide the scientific research community with a comprehensive and world-class product portfolio of reagents, assays, instruments, and custom manufacturing and testing services. I would like to highlight that Novus's LC3B antibody is the most widely trusted and cited antibody to monitor autophagy induction, and Tokris offers a wide range of small molecules for the study of autophagy. Also, we'd like to invite you to ask questions during the webinar by using the Ask a Question box, which is located just below the presentation screen. During the Q&A session directly following the presentation, I will then ask Dr. Cononio your questions. If you are interested in additional educational content on autophagy, please go to the Resources tab located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for further information. And with that brief introduction, I'll hand over control to Dr. Cononio. So thank you, Darcy, for, for, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. So today, in this webinar, I, I would like to, to discuss two lines of research we have in the lab uh, concerning uh, uh, autophagy, and more precisely, macro-autophagy. First, we are interested in uh, the regulation of the process and in the second part of the talk, I will discuss a more physiological and pathophysiological aspect uh, related to the role of autophagy in stress response and more precisely on uh, mechanical stress. So probably, uh, as most of you know, uh, macro-autophagy uh, uh, runs in, in uh, uh, eukaryotic cells and start with, from a membrane named phagophore and the membrane elongate to form a, a seal vacuole named autophagosome. And this autophagosome is able to trap either in a bulk manner or in a, in a selective manner a uh, fraction of the cytoplasm. And the end of the macroautophagic pathway is a fusion of autophagosome with acidic compartment endosomal compartment and lysosomal compartment. And at the end of the day, cargo are degraded in, in the lysosomal compartment. So, uh, of course, uh, autophagy run at a basal level in most cell type, and it can be, the process can be induced by various stimuli, and in this sense, macroautophagy is a stress response. Uh, macrotophagy can be uh, stimulated, for example, by a nutritional stress, meaning by starvation of nutrients, by oxidative stress, by intracellular stress situations such as ER stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, 
and also accumulation of uh, uh, aggregate of protein or accumulation of uh, damaged organelles. So, uh, uh, as a consequence, autophagy is very important to to, to provide uh, uh, energy by degradating proteins and lipid, for example, to produce amino acids and fatty acids to maintain uh, cellular metabolism. But it's also a, a, a quality control for the cytoplasm by uh, the degradation of a damaged organelle and the removal of protein aggregate. So the process is also associated with a lot of membrane remodeling and is also able to modulate uh, a signaling pathway by degradating some uh, uh, protein involved in, in signaling. So as a consequence, this mechanism is very important in, 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 in biology and, for example, autophagy is important for cell survival and to, to tip the balance between survival and cell death is also engaged in differentiation development in the regulation of metabolism, and we know now that autophagy plays a role also in uh, immune response, uh, uh, innate immune response, and acqua immune response. And uh, a phase of autophagy is also engaged uh, in uh, sequestrating microorganisms that invite uh, the, the cytoplasm, bacteria or viruses. So, of course, this regulation of autophagy uh, is associated with many diseases, and some of these diseases are characterized, in fact, by mutation on autophagy protein, and autophagy play a role from uh, cancer to chronic inflammatory diseases such as Crohn disease, neurodegenerative diseases, and also metabolic diseases such as obesity and uh, type 2 uh, diabetes. So as I told you in, uh, uh, in the introduction, I will first discuss some aspect of the regulation of autophagy where I'm interested in the lab. And uh, as Darcy mentioned, uh, our story starts with uh, the discovery in, in 2000 in collaboration with Fred Mayer in Amsterdam that two PI3 kinases are engaged in the regulation of autophagy. So class one, Phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase downstream of the insulin receptor, in fact, in most cells, have an inhibitory effect on autophagy because it activates mTOR, and the kinase mTOR is known to repress uh, autophagy. On the other side, in fact, autophagy is stimulated by class 3 phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase, and I, I would mention here you know, that the study roots, in fact, in the seminal discovery, in the seminal discovery by Paul Gordon uh, and, and Per Seglen, that 3-methyladenine, a well-known inhibitor of autophagy, is in, was in fact an inhibitor of PI3 kinase. And following on with his discovery, Fred Mayer and Edward Blomart show, in fact, that Vortmanin and other PS3 kinase inhibitors are also able to block uh, autophagy by blocking the activity of class 3 PS3 kinase. Of course, on this slide, I would like to mention the seminal discovery by Bess Levin of Becklin 1, and Becklin 1 is one of the autophagy proteins that interact with uh, class 3 PI3 kinase. So the product of class 3 PI3 kinase, as you know, is phosphatidylinositol 3 phosphate. This lipid is very important in autophagy, but is not restricted to the autophagic pathway. In fact, the major reservoir of this lipid is the endocytic pathway, early endosome and inner vesicle of late endosome. But PI3P is also present at the cell surface close to the primary cilium and also associated with phagocytosis. So an important step to the understanding of the function of PI3P in autophagy and to the selectivity for autophagy was brought by the discovery by Oshumi and colleagues that, in fact, class 3 PH3 kinase, also known as VPS34, uh, 
can be in, in, in different complexes. In fact, complex one, where VPS-34 associate with its, its partner, VPS-15, interact in, with ATG-14 and backlink one of VPS-30 in years. And this complex controls the formation of autophagosome. Whereas when VPS-34 and VPS-15 are associated with the protein of RAG in complex 2, this complex control uh, endocytosis and or late stage of the autophagic pathway. And this complex, the activity of this complex is regulated by a protein and rubicon that inhibit the activity of this complex. A further understanding uh, on the activity of this complex cells was recently brought by uh, uh, structural data showing, in fact, that the, these two complex cells uh, can act on different membranes. For example, complex 2 is able to produce a PI3P at the surface of large on liposomes and small liposomes, whereas complex 1 is only able to produce PI3P uh, at the surface of small liposome. This result shows the importance of the geometry of the membrane to uh, determine the activity of these complex cells. And moreover, it has been recently shown that complex 2 bind more weakly to phosphatidylinositol containing membrane than complex 1. So, in fact, phosphatidylinositol is a substrate for, for uh, VPS-34. And this result is very interesting in light of the recent report by Mizushima and colleagues in Japan. <coughs> and this group show, in fact, that the Hulk-1 complex which is the first complex engaged in the formation of the autophagosome, initiate autophagosome formation at phosphatidylinositol synthase in rich endoplasmic reticulum subdomain. So with this in mind, we can now put all the players in the picture, and you can see on this slide that the, the, mach the autophagy machinery with this ATG protein are recruited at the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, the PI3 kinase complex 1, as I told you previously, is controlled by the activity of the ALK1 complex by phosphorylation and ubiquitination, and the PI3, uh, the PI3 uh, kinase complex 1, in fact, produce PI3P. And this lipid, in fact, has at least two uh, interactors in the autophagic pathway. First, PI3P interact with a protein named DFCP1. And DFCP1, in fact, is localized in a part of the ER called the omegasome. And uh, uh, this was discovered by Nick Kistakis and colleague in UK. And as you can observe from the reconstitution, uh, that uh, uh, in fact uh, the ER in purple serves on the omegasome as a sort of cradle to elongate the phagophore in yellow. Another important partner for PI3P is a protein named WIPI. And the WIP proteins are, in fact, uh, the yeast autologue of the ATG18. And this protein is important to uh, recute on the phagophore the first ubiquitin-like conjugation system where ATG5 is covalently linked to ATG12. And this conjugate interact with the protein ATG16. And, in fact, in TG16, interact with WIP. And this conjugate is very important to activate the second conjugate in the autophagic pathway, meaning the ATG8 or in mammalian cells, the uh, LC3 uh, conjugate 
And in this conjugate, in fact, the C terminus of LC3 is conjugate to the polar head of PE or phosphatidyl ethanolamine. And at the end of the day, when the autophagosome is formed and releases, only a fraction of LC3 remain associated with the autophagosome. And uh, uh, only the, the, the LC3 associated with the inner membrane will be transported to the lysosome, and the part of LC3 associated with the external membrane is released to the cytosol. So another important player is the protein ETG9, and ETG9, in fact, is the only transmembrane ETG protein. And vesicles containing ETG9 contribute to the very early stage of, of the autophagosome formation. Roughly, we can say that ETG9 controls the number of autophagosome form, and LC3 controls, in fact, the size of the autophagosome. So, of course, uh, the things are more complex. We know that the ER is important to contribute to autophagosome formation, but in the literature now we know that many membranes can contribute to the autophagosome formation from uh, uh, a Golgi apparatus, but also plasma membrane, endosomes, and, and also I would like to, to focus on the importance of, of contact site. And in fact, Yoshimori and colleague showed that contact site between the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria are important to recute the autophagy machinery to initiate the autophagosome formation. And probably, as you know, the endoplasmic reticulum is able to have contact site with most of the organelles in cells from uh, endosome, Golgi apparatus, uh, lysosome, peroxisome, lipid droplet, and also with the plasma membrane. So since uh, the plasma membrane has also been shown to contribute to autophagosome formation, in the lab, we ask the question whether ER plasma membrane contact site can contribute to autophagosome biogenesis. So the project in the lab is under the supervision of a young PI, Etienne Morel, in collaboration with a, a postdoc, Anna Chiara, Anna Simbeni, and this is part of a collaboration with Francesca Giordano in France, who is an expert in uh, ER contact site, and also with the lab of Maya Vaccaro in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So, briefly, what are uh, ER plasma membrane contact sites? So, the tethering of ER with the plasma membrane is depend, dependent on protein name extended synaptotagamine, and there are three ECs, ec one, two, and three. And these contact sites are important for lipid transfer, but also for uh, calcium movement. So on the upper slide, we can observe the localization of, uh, in green of uh, EC2, and the protein by confocal microscopy is only observed, uh, let's say, close to, to the substratum, meaning close to the plasma membrane, and we have no localization of ECRs in the perinuclear uh, area. So in a first series of experiments using ELA cells, we ask the question whether, in response to an autophagy stimuli, there is a, a dynamic of this contact site. So for this, we, we transfected ELA cells with a, a, a osradish peroxidase tagged at the C-terminal with a KDUL motif, which is an a, a, a ER retention motif, and thereafter, uh, by using a substrate for osradish peroxidase, we, we, we stain the endoplasmic reticulum. And at the EM level, we made a quantification of ER plasma membrane contact site. And, uh, and this was made in control cells and in cells after starvation. And as I told you previously, starvation is an inducer of autophagy. And for example, you can observe from the western blot in C, 
that we have an accumulation of the protein LC32 during the starv- period of starvation, and this reflect, in fact, the increase in autophagosome formation. And at the same time, we observe the degradation of the protein P62, and this protein is a cargo for the autophagic pathway. So when we starve cells, we observe an increase in the number of contact sites, and interestingly, we also observe an increase of the level of EC2 and EC3. We failed to observe any significant change in EC1, and uh, more importantly, we failed to observe any change in other protein from the endoplasmic reticulum, such as calnexin or syntexin 17. So it seems that in response to an autophagy stimuli, there is a, a dynamic of this contact site and increase. I have no time to, discuss, to show this, but we observe this phenomenon with other stimuli than, uh, than uh, starvation. So the question was, what is going on when we modulate, modulate this contact site? Are we able to modulate the autophagic response? So for this, we, we, we knock down e in ELA cells, and from Francesca's work, we know that to, 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 to block the formation of ER uh, plasma membrane contact site, we have to knock down the three e So we knock down the three e and thereafter we, we, we starve cells and we analyze autophagy. So, and you can observe that in, when we knock down e we have an impairment in the accumulation of LC32. And on the contrary, you can observe an accumulation of the protein P62, meaning that the, there is an impairment in the, autoph- in the autophagic pathway, and we have less degradation of an autophagic cargo. So we also observe, according to the decrease in the level of LC32, um, this protein reflects, in fact, the number of autophagosomes. We observe uh, uh, less uh, LC3 puncte when we knock down e uh, When we transfected GFP-LC3, we have less uh, 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 LC3 puncte than in control cells. Uh, after t- starvation. But interestingly, we observe that the decrease of, in the number of puncte is mainly associated at the cell periphery and not too much in the perinuclear region. So, the question was, well, well are we able to, to identify, in fact, protein engaged in the autophagic process at contact ER plasma membrane contact site? And are we able to detect, in fact, PI3P, uh, which is an important lipid in, in the biogenesis of autophagosome, as previously told? So just a point, uh, a, a technical point. We use, in fact, a, a GST uh, five prob. So, as you know, the five domain of protein is is a is a domain that recognizes PI3P, and we use a, a GST f- f- a five that we can use as a primary antibody. Another way to detect PI3P is to transfect cells with a GFP5 prob. But we and others reported that when you transfect cells with a GFP5, you modulate, in fact, uh, the autophagic pathway. You induce an artifact. So we prefer to use this approach to detect PI3P. So doing, doing this, when, when, when we starve cells, we, 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 we wanted to detect, the, uh, let's say, the autophagosome pool, of PI3P, and for this, you can observe in the lower panels that we have a, a co-distribution of PI3P with LC3 in blue and also with e in red. Whereas when we analyze uh, the endosomal pool of PI3P and this uh, PI3P, in fact, uh, colocalized with EEE1, so the black uh, arrow red, you can observe the colocalization of PI3P with 
uh, uh, E1. However, uh, for this guy, you fail to observe any co-localization or co-distribution with LC3 and e -certs. So PI3P engaged in autophagy seems to be recruited at uh, ER plasma membrane contact site and dis co-distributed with e -certs. So the question was, uh, are the proteins that interact with PI3P, meaning DFCP1 and WP2, are also recruited at this contact site? And the answer is yes. On the upper panel, you can observe that DFCP1 in green co-distributed co with LC3, the autophagy marker, but also co-distributed with ECIT, uh, the ER plasma membrane marker, and in red, of course, also co-distributed with um, the endoplasmic reticulum uh, stain with a SEC61 beta antibody. The so same all through for uh, WP2, and WP2, in fact, in the lower panel, co-distributed with the ER, and also co-distributed with ECIT in green. So following on these results, we, we, we we, we, we wanted to know whether we, are, we were able to detect autophagic structure close to the plasma membrane and also the ER. So uh, a, a first technique we used was to use confocal microscopy to detect LC3 and the endoplasmic reticulum close to the plasma membrane, and you, we observe this by, uh, by confocal microscopy. You can observe the, the dots, uh, uh, LC3 dots and ER uh, close to, to the substratum. However, to be sure that this events occur to close to the substratum, we use another technique. We use uh, uh, total internal reflection fluorescence or TF microscopy, and this technique allows us to detect events very close to the plasma membrane, in fact, in the range of 100 nanometer. And you can observe, uh, so on, on, on the left, so the ER is present uh, close to the plasma membrane, and when we start cells, we start to, to, uh, to observe LC3 dots, and we have the quantification, so we are quite sure that autophagic structures are localized close to the plasma membrane. So we went a step further and analyzed the process at the, at the level of electron microscopy, and uh, an example uh, is given on, uh, on, on the upper panel, on, on the left side, we observe uh, the plasma membrane, the cortical ER in black, and an autophagic structure uh, pointed by the blue or red. Similarly, we perform some immunogold with uh, anti an anti-LC3 and also to detect e and both proteins are detected uh, with the cortical ER and the plasma membrane. We also apply uh, confocal microscopy and reconstitution and super-resolution microscopy. And with super-resolution microscopy, you can observe that LC3 and uh, ECS are very close, in fact, and this protein are associated with the endoplasmic reticulum in green. So following on these results, we wanted to, to know uh, how the system work uh, at the molecular level. So uh, first we, we analyze uh, the two complexes that act very early in the autophagic pathway uh, because we detected PI3P and PI3P is a quite early events during the autophagosome formation. So first we analyze the ERLK1 complex. Uh, and the ERC1 complex, as I told you, is the first complex that act during autophagosome formation in response to starvation. And uh, uh, we observe, the, we analyze this complex in control cells, both in uh, basal condition or in, in, under starvation, meaning with a plus. And we perform the same analysis in cells with a triple knockdown of ECITS where we have an impairment, in fact, in the autophagic pathway, in autophagosome formation. So what we observe is that whatever the condition, 
there is no change in, in, in the stability of the protein of this complex. For example, we have no change in the level of ATG13, which is one component of the co complex. Uh, 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 on lens 3, we have no change in, 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 in the level of the ALK protein. And moreover, this complex seems to be functional because it is known that when you starve cells, you have a dephosphorylation of ALK1 and at a site sensitive to mTOR because mTOR is inhibited, autophagy is induced, and it is known that this induces a dephosphorylation of ALK1 at the mTOR sensitive site. And we observe the same phenomenon in control cells or in cells with a triple knockdown of ECS. So we turn our interest to the second complex, meaning the complex with Beclin-1, ATG-14, and class 3 PIS3 kinase, so the PIS3 kinase complex 1. And what we observe under this situation is that when we triple knockdown ECRs, even in basal condition and also after salvation, we have less Beclin-1 and less ATG-14. We have not analyzed yet in detail whether this is a degradation, but we have some evidence for that. But in contrast, we failed to observe no difference in the level of VPS-34. <clears throat> so with this in mind, we analyze more, more, more precisely, in fact, uh, the level of PI3P engaged in autophagy and engaged in endocytosis in starved cells. So for this, we were able to discriminate between uh, the endosomal pool of PI3P and the autophagosomal pool of PI3P, as previously shown by costaining with uh, E1 and LC3. So when we starve cells, uh, we, we fail to observe any difference in the level of, endos, uh, of the endosomal pool of PI3P uh, between control cells, a black bar, or uh, in triple knockdown ECR cells, uh, the ash bar. However, when we focus on the autophagosomal pool of PI3P, we observe, in fact, a decrease in the accumulation of the auto, uh, 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 of the autophagosomal pool of PI3P when we knock down ECITS protein. So as I told you previously, we, we failed to observe any change in the level of VPS-34, and according to those results, when we analyze the activity of VPS-34 in vitro, we failed to observe no difference between control cells and triple knockdown cells. So something is going wrong with the complex one that produce PI3P in the autophagic pathway. So we, 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 to, to make the conclusion, and, uh, and uh, we, what we showed is that uh, the autophagy machinery can be recruited at the ER plasma membrane contact site. Here we have another example with uh, ATG16, for example, on the left side of the slide, we have ECS and uh, uh, ATG16 that are co-distributed. And in fact, we came with, 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 with this, with complementary experiment, I have no time to, to show, is that in fact, the PI3 kinase complex 1 is known to interact with a, a transmembrane protein of the ER named VMP1, discovered by, uh, by Maya Vaccaro in Buenos Aires. And this lab shows, in fact, that VMP1 interacts with Becklin 1. And on the other hand, in, in our work, we have been able to show that VMP1 also interacts with EC2. So, in fact, this protein makes a bridge between uh, 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 the PI3 kinase complex 1 and, um, and ER plasma membrane contact site, and thereafter uh, there is production of PI3P and uh, maybe downstream formation of autophagosome. So here what is interesting is that in this work we show that ER plasma membrane contact site contribute to the formation of autophagosome and as 
uh, I previously told you is that ER mitochondria contact site contribute to autophagosome formation. So what we made is a quantification of the contribution of this contact site in the formation of autophagosome during starvation. And we came to the conclusion that, in fact, about 30% of autophagosome in starved cells emanate from ER plasma membrane contact site. And also 30% of autophagosome emanate from uh, ER mitochondria contact site. So that makes that this contact, contact site contribute to 60% of the autophagosome form in, 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 in starvation. And the remaining 40% are associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, but we don't know yet whether other contact sites can contribute to the formation of, of, of this autophagosome. So, uh, at the end of this part, uh, I, I hope I convince you that ER contact sites are important in the autophagic pathway to control autophagosome biogenesis and also probably also to control autophagosome uh, maturation as probably uh, recently shown with uh, uh, ER uh, lysosome contact site depending on, on the level of cholesterol in cells. So now I would like to, 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 to change the topic and go to the second topic, as autophagy as a stress response and more precisely to focus on shear stress. Of course, you know and we know that autophagy is a stress response conserved to years to mammals and including also in plants but also in dictyostelium and drosophila in cell elegance, also in zebrafish, in, in most systems, autophagy is a, is a stress response. We know well how our organism responds to starvation, to hypoxia, to roast, to induce autophagy, and also in pathological situations. Uh, it is an important topic in, in the cancer field that autophagy, in fact, is induced uh, by, by therapy. Uh, However, less is known about the role of mechanical, the crosstalk between autophagy and mechanical stress. So we know in physiology for ages from uh, the pioneering work in the autophagy field starting in the 50, that hormones such as glucagon and insulin can regulate autophagy. For example, in the liver, glucagon stimulate autophagy and insulin inhibit autophagy. And of course, nutrient and, for example, amino acid in the liver are inhibitor of the autophagic pathway. So this, uh, however, there is another other player in physiology which are mechanical stress. And mechanical stress are very important in physiology. For example, compression in bone and muscle and stretching, for example, in muscle during exercise, but also stretching, stretching is involved in the heart, in blood vessel and lung tissue. And in the lab, we focus on shear stress. And shear stress is important in the circulatory system due to blood flow and also in the kidney due to the urinary flow. So, uh, we, we, in the lab, we investigate first shear stress in the kidney, and this project is under the supervision of an assistant professor, Nicolas Dupont, and uh, in collaboration with a PhD student who is now a postdoc, Idi Laurent. And the work was a, 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 a collaboration in our institute with a group of Fabio Laterzi, Thierry Capio, and also we have a, 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 on this project a collaboration with a group of Wolfgang Kuhn in Germany. So briefly, as you know, in the kidney, uh, 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 cells uh, lining the proximal tubule of the kidney are subject as suggest to, to a, 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 a shear stress induced by the u urinary flow. And th this can be reproduced in, in vitro by using the device shown on, 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 on the right part of the slide. So we have a chamber. In this chamber, you can, we plate uh, kidney epithelial cells. We perform the experiment with 
value cell line, and uh, these cells are polar, polarized. And of course, after you apply uh, a flow using the device, and we control the flow, and we apply a laminar uh, shear stress of one dirn per centimeter square, which reflects roughly uh, the, sear, the flow observed in vivo in, in the proximal tubule of the kidney. So what we observe, in fact, is that when, we, when you apply a, 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 a shear stress to, 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 to kidney cells, for example, here, uh, MDCK cells, what you observe, in fact, is a, a time-dependent reduction in cell size. So I should mention that this reduction in cell size is not an increase in cell proliferation, first point. And the second point, as you can observe on, on the upper panel, uh, with the staining with e cadherin which, which is a, a marker for cell polarity, we, we retain the polarity when we induce shear stress. Of course, next we wanted to analyze autophagy uh, in response to shear stress, and one, so we use MDCK cells, but also other cell, cell line, and the cells were stably transfected with a GFPLC3, and what we observe is that when we induce uh, shear stress for several days, we have the black bar and increase, in fact, in the level of LC3-2. And as a control, we use the same cell cells uh, in static condition without uh, flow, and we fail to observe significant increase in the level of LC32. I just mentioned on, on, the, on the upper panel that in red, we have stained the primary cilium because uh, kidney epithelial cells are ciliated, and I will come back to this point a little bit later. So, of course, as you know, when you observe an accumulation of LC3 uh, puncta, that, that could reflect either an increase in the autophagic pathway from the formation of autophagosome to the degradation in the lysosome, or a blockade in the autophagic pathway and an accumulation of autophagosome. To, to, to answer this question, we repeat this experiment by transfected cell by the so-called tandem probe. So this probe is a RFP, GFP, LC3 probe. So the, 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 the basis for the use of this probe is that in autophagosome, uh, you have yellow dots because you have the green and the red fluorescence, whereas when you move to the autolysosome, you have only the red fluorescence, you have red dots because in the lysosomal compartment, due to the, the acidic environment, there is a quenching of, of the green fluorescence. So we, we use this probe, and as you can observe, uh, the black bar in static and the black bar after one day, for example, of shear stress, reflects the total number of dots. So we have an increase in the total number of dots. And we also, have, we also observe an increase in the number of autophagosomes, the white bar. But more interestingly here is that under shear stress, we observe an increase, in fact, in the gray bar, meaning in the, in the red dots, meaning in autolysosome. So that means that we have more autophagosome form and we have more uh, autolysosome form when we trigger uh, uh, shear stress. So next, what is autophagy instrumental in regulating, in fact, the volume, uh, uh, cell volume in response to shear stress? To, to approach this, we use a a genetic approach by knocking down ATG5 or ATG16 to protein involved in, uh, in autophagosome formation by a SHRNA ap uh, approach, and we use the same cells, and the SHRNA can be, uh, the expression of the SHRNA can be in use but when we are APTG to cells, and we use also a pharmacological approach, for example, by using 3-methyladenine, an inhibitor, of autophagosome formation.
So after four days of, 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 of shear stress, what we observe when we uh, knock down ATG5, ATG16, or when we add 3 methyladenine is, of course, already, as expected, a reduction in LC3 dots and a reduction in autophagy. But interestingly here, when we analyze the cell size or cell volume, what we observe, if, in fact, is that when in response to an impairment of autophagy, cells are no longer to correctly uh, decrease the, the, the cell size. So the, the question next was to understand how shear stress can be uh, integrated at the cell surface to control the autophagic pathway and downstream to control uh, cell size. In fact, uh, it has been shown some years ago by uh, Kuhn and colleagues that the primary cilium present at the apical side of uh, kidney epithelial cells uh, control uh, cell size. Moreover, uh, in, in a collaborative effort with the lab of Ana Maria Cuervo uh, uh, in New York and with uh, a, a postdoc, Olatz Pamiega, we have been able to show some years ago that, in fact, uh, there is a cross talk between the autophagy and the primary cilium, and in response to serum, in fact, the primary cilium is able to trigger uh, the autophagic pathway. So briefly, the primary cilium is a microtubule-based structure present at the surface of many cell types, and, uh, and in the case of kidney epithelial cells present at the apical side. And this structure is very important to coordinate many signaling pathways, for example, the HOG pathway, the PDGF pathway, the WIND pathway. But the primary cilium is not only a, a chemical sensor, it's also a, 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 man, a mechanical sensor, as that was shown by Kuhn and colleagues in the kidney, that, uh, in fact, the primary cilium is important to integrate shear stress induced by the urinary flow. So we ask the question whether the primary cilium can be upstream of the autophagic pathway to control cell size. <coughs> so for this in vitro, we use different uh, strategy to uh, block ciliogenesis. And one of the strategy was to knock down by a SHRNA approach the protein KIF3A. And KIF3A, in fact, is a protein uh, uh, that is part of kinesin 2, and kinesin 2 is a motor that move along microtubule to the apex. And when you knock down, you block the activity of kinesin 2. And when you knock down Keeps rate is known that you block ciliogenesis. So what, what is going on with autophagy? When we knock down ciliogenesis, we observe a reduction in, uh, in, in autophagy in response to shear stress. And again, interestingly, when we analyze the cell size, size volume, we observe, in fact, that cells with a knockdown of uh, Keeps 3A, so the black bar after 4 day the cells are less prone than control cells, a white bar to control uh, uh, cell size and cell volume. So we, 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 we move from this to in vivo because uh, uh, Wolfgang Kuhn in his lab has a conditional mouse model with invalidation of kif 3 a in the kidney. So we, we translate our in vitro uh, results in, in, in vivo, and what we observe, in fact, in the proximal tubule in the kidney is, of course, in the mutant animal, less primary cilium, shown in red on, on, on the upper panel, and we also observe less LC3 dots, shown in, in, uh, in green in the upper panel. And here again, in vivo, when we block cellulogenesis and downstream we block autophagy, what we observe is an impairment in cell size regulation. You can observe that cells in mutant animal are bigger than in control cells. So autophagy seems to play an important role in controlling cell size in the proximal tubule of the kidney and its this event is very important to control the, the, the geometry uh, 
and in fact uh, of the proximal tubule. So I, I will not emphasize, but just mention that we have been able to analyze a signaling pathway coming down from the primary cilium in response to shear stress to trigger autophagy and to trigger cell regulation. So as we, we observe, in fact, I would say two waves of autophagy. The first wave is dependent on a protein present in the primary cilium called polycystin 2, and this is a, a, a calcium channel. And we observe auto, an early autophagic response before uh, uh, before the cell size regulation. But this uh, polycystin 2 dependent autophagy does not seem in our system to be engaged in cell volume regulation. We don't know yet what is the function of this wave of autophagy. But we observe a second wave, I, I should say, that triggers the activation of a kinase named LKB1. LKB1 activates the kinase, IMP kinase, and as you know, probably IMP kinase block inhibit autophagy. And this is upstream, and the inhibition of autophagy trigger autophagy and induce a cell size and cell volume regulation. So, to, 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 end up, to close up this talk, I would like just to show this, that we extend this result to another model, to the endothelium. And the work, in fact, was performed in Chantal Boulanger and Pierre-Emmanuel Routou in Paris at the Cardiovascular Institute. And uh, in the lab, we collaborate with Nicolas Dupont to this project. So interestingly, uh, uh, in, in the outer, for example, it is known that uh, uh, endothelial cells are, 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 are suggest to uh, high shear stress in the descending part of outer and low shear stress at the level of the arctic arch and in the bifurcation. So we analyze the level of autophagy in response to high shear stress and in response to low shear stress due to the blood flow. So first, in vivo, using a uh, mouse model, analyzing um, the uh, autophagy in zone of high shear stress and in zone of, high, of low shear stress, we observe more, in fact, LC3 dots in the zone of high shear stress and in the zone of low shear stress. And this was also reproduced in vitro by using a, a cell, an endothelial cell line, UVEX cells. And in fact, you can observe that under low shear stress, meaning 2D in per centimeter square, and quite high shear stress, 20D in per centimeter square, which roughly accommodate to the in vivo a parameter, we observe at the EM more autophagic structure at in, in high shear stress than in low shear stress. And accordingly, when we analyze the level of LC32, we observe more accumulation in a time-dependent manner of, of, of LC32 uh, uh, in the presence of high shear stress than in the presence of low shear stress. However, as previously told, the accumulation of LC32, uh, uh, we, are, we have to answer, when we observe an accumulation of LC32, we have to answer the question whether or not there is an increase in the autophagic pathway or a blockade in the autophagic pathway. So for, for this, we use again in vitro, in UVEX cells, tandem probe, and here again we observe uh, much more uh, red dots, meaning autolysosome in the zone of high shear stress and in the zone of la, uh, low shear stress. And moreover, we analyze the event of fusion between autophagosome and autolysosome by performing double staining with an anti-LC3 and an anti-LAM2. LAM2 is a marker of the lysosomal compartment. We have much more uh, event of fusion of autophagosome with lysosome in the zone of high shear stress and in the zone of low shear stress. And in fact, the same all through in vivo. And to analyze the autophagic flux in vivo, we injected mice with chloroquine. And chloroquine is a lysosomal inhibitor, is a lysosomal trope, 
it, 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 it uh, accumulates in the lysosome and quench the lysosomal pH and blocks the degradation of LC32. And you can observe that in uh, the zone of high stress, when we injected uh, chloroquine, uh, in fact, we have more accumulation of LC32, meaning that we block, in fact, the autophagic flux, whereas there is not too much change in the zone of low shear stress in vivo. So these results were also translated into uh, uh, pathophysiology because uh, by using, in fact, uh, uh, human carotid at atherosclerotic plaque obtained after endoterectomy, what it is known, in fact, is that upstream of the plague, there is a high shear stress. And downstream of the plague, there is a low shear stress. And here again, interestingly, in this setting, we observe the same difference, meaning more autophagy, more accumulation of, uh, of, um, of LC3 dots in, in the zone of high shear stress, upstream of the plague, than in the zone of low shear stress downstream of the plague uh, symbolized uh, on, on the graph by the black, uh, black square. So what, what, what we did next is to, uh, uh, what Chantal and Pierre-Emmanuel did, in fact, was to analyze uh, the process in vivo in a model of atherosclerosis, uh, a model widely used in uh, the atherosclerosis atherosclerosis field is apo lipoprotein E minus minus mice. And it is known that these mice accumulate lipids so, uh, uh, in the endothelium, in the aorta, and mainly at the level of the aortic cross where there is a low shear stress, as you can observe on the aorta, on the left aorta. So what, what, what was done next was to cross back this animal with an autophagy deficient model with the conditional invalidation of ETG5 in endothelial cells. And one you can observe on, on the very, um, very right part of the slide is now you can observe fat deposit in the descending part of the aorta. And on the left, we have the quantification, meaning we have on, on the high shear stress an increase in the fat deposit in animals uh, with invalidation of ETG5 with reduction in the autophagic process, whereas there is not too much change, in fact, in the zone of, of, of low shear stress. So, with this scheme, uh, under high shear stress, and this autophagy in endothelial cells is heteroprotective. And here again, I did not detail the results, we observe that the induction of autophagy is dependent on the activation of MP kinase and on the inhibition of mTOR. Whereas in the stress, when you block autophagy in the zone of high shear stress, you have a low level of autophagy. And we report in this study, in fact, that this low level apoptosis, senescence, the release of inflammatory cytokine, and also impair the uh, endothelial cell uh, alignment, which has a uh, 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 hallmark, in fact, of uh, atherosclerosis. So the last, the, this last slide summarizes the results on, on this part. We, we analyze the effect of shear stress on autophagy in the kidney. We can conclude that at, uh, uh, the urinary flow is epithelial cells, and the pathway is dependent on activation of MP kinase, inhibition of mTOR, and the function is to regulate cell size. And uh, the shear stress is integrated at the cell surface by the primary cilium to trigger autophagy. In the endothelium, the blood flow is able to trigger autophagy again by activating MP kinase, blocking mTOR, 
and this is this uh, autophagy is heteroprotective. However, in this setting, we don't know yet what is a cell surface transducer to trigger autophagy. So very lastly, I would like to conclude with some um, open question in the field of autophagy related to this talk and beyond. So from very basic science, we, 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 a question still open is what is the origin of, of autophagosomal membrane? What are the lipid sources, or rather, what are the lipid sources? Also, what is the interaction of, uh, between autophagy and intracellular trafficking, endocytosis, exocytosis? Uh, what so-called non-canonical autophagy can tell us about to understand better the role of ATG protein. With non-canonical autophagy, I mentioned the role of ATG protein in the secretion of proteins or secretion of small molecules such as ATP, or also the role of ATG protein in, uh, in phagocytosis through LC3-associated phagocytosis. What is the function of this non-canonical a pathway in physiology and pathophysiology. Of course, still big question on uh, 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 script should be better defined is a cross talk between autophagy and cell death, but also autophagy and cell uh, proliferation. I would mention we know for ages that autophagy is a cell autonomous function process, but now we know that autophagy also a non-cell autonomous function, and this has been clearly shown in cancer. What is the role of non-cell autonomous function in physiology? And lastly, what is the role of autophagy in integrative physiology? For example, the relation between autophagy and circadian clock, and so something what is emerging, what is fascinating, is the role of autophagy in longevity. Uh, now it, there is a a large panel of evidence to, to state that autophagy is an anti-aging mechanism. So very lastly, I would like to, not to detail this slide, but just to thank all the people of my team, those who I presented the work today, but also other people. Thanks our collaboration and leave you with these two views of FAGO4, one from, uh, from artists, Artophagy, let's say. And the second one is a natural one. It's a very nice beach in the south part of Greece. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that very informative presentation, Dr. Cadanio. We've already received a great number of questions, but before we begin the panel discussion, I'd like to remind attendees about the resources tab located on the upper right-hand corner of the screen which contains literature and posters on autophagy from Novus Biologicals and Congress Bioscience. Uh, this includes two pieces that were co-authored by Dr. Caragno. Um, and also, this presentation has been recorded and will be available uh, for viewing following the webinar. So if you still have any questions for Dr. Caragno, you can submit them using the Ask a Question box, which is located just below the presentation screen. So with that, uh, the first question I'd like to start with is, uh, what is the contribution of mitochondria to ERPM interaction? Ah, <clears throat> the contribution of mitochondria to ER plasma membrane contact site. Ah, we, we don't know yet. Uh, just what, what, what can I say is that in, in, we, we observe uh, by... Uh, different technique uh, that s some mitochondria can be closely uh, 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 localized near ER plasma membrane contact site. But at the moment, we don't know whether uh, 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 the dialogue between these th three partners, meaning plasma membrane, ER mitochondria, can work together at the same place. That, that, that's an interesting question because we observe su such structure, but uh, we have no answer to that at the moment. Okay. Um, another question. Um, in the normal heart, uh, what could be the percentage of cargos from ER versus or plasma membranes. 
sorry, sorry, Darcy, I don't hear sorry. you very well. Can you repeat the question? Excuse me. Heart, uh, so it's a mechanically stretching organ. What would be the percentage of cargos from ER versus mitochondria or plasma membrane? You mean the, the percentage of, of cargo in, uh, well, the percentage of cargo in uh, autophagosomes, that, that's the question. Uh, yes, that's yeah. what it says here. Yeah, I, I would say autophagy, and this can, uh, of course, if you t trigger mitophagy, you will have other organal, but I come back to very old study by Per Seglen and colleague. Uh, when you starve cells, in fact, uh, he made the quantification of, of uh, the, the organelle he can identify inside the autophagosome, and uh, of course, he made the ratio with organelle outside of autophagosome. And he came down to the conclusion that the ratio is the same. So that was one of the evidence for uh, the bulk aspect of, of photophagy. Did I answer your question? Um, yes, I think they're having trouble hearing. Um, is anyone else having trouble hearing? Can you send a message if that's the case? Okay, well, let's try another question. Maybe it's just a few people that are having difficulty. Um, have you, I know you had mentioned earlier that uh, you were looking at uh, other forms of autophagy induction. And so someone asked, um, have you tried using inhibitors of mTOR like rapamycin? Um, and if yes, do they mimic the effects of starvation that you observed on the autophagosome formation? You may not... Um in the first part of the talk, you mean if we use other inhibitors, other stimulators? Yes, we 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 we, we repeat this experiment uh, by using uh, uh, taurine, for example, which is an inhibitor of mTOR. We we also use uh, mechanical stress to trigger autophagy, and in all this setting, what we observe is an increase in ER plasma membrane contact site. So is not unique to, uh, to, to starvation. Now, one, one of the questions we want to answer is that, uh, 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 is there any uh, selectivity from the localization of ER plasma membrane contact site to, to, con to, to, to sequester some, some cargo, in fact? Okay, um, I think people are still having some difficulty hearing, so we'll do the best to answer a couple more questions, um, and then I'll just let everyone know that um, they will have access to this recording later on to, to hear the uh, remaining questions. Um, can you see some relation between BCL2 levels in autophagosome formation? Uh, we, we, we have not investigated this directly, but of, of course it is known from, from the literature, from Beth Levin lab, that uh, BCL2 can interact with, uh, with Beclid 1 and, and block uh, autophagy. But we have not, uh, in the work I presented today, we, we have not investigated the, this aspect. We don't know here whether... BCL2 can be a regulator of, uh, uh, of shear stress dependent autophagy. We, we, we don't know. We have not investigated this point, no. Okay. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions. Uh, one is uh, how does autophagy affect crosstalk between cells in terms of adhesion molecules, for example? Sorry, Darcy, uh, can you repeat the question? Yes. Because I, I hear you very bad, in fact, now. At the beginning, okay. it was perfect, but now... We, now we're having you, difficulty. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. How, how does autophagy affect the crosstalk between cells in terms of adhesion molecules, for example? 
Uh, I want to fudge you can, oh yeah, uh, for example, it has been clearly shown in cancer that, for example, cells from the uh, microenvironment, autophagy uh, can produce, via the degradation of protein, some amino acids. Uh, and the, these amino acids can be used by the tumors to fuel tumor cells. And uh, this is one of the crosstalk, meaning the product of degradation in one cell type can be used by another cell type. So this is a notion of non-cell autonomous function of autophagy. Okay, I'm going to uh, end it with one more question, um, and that is, um, is the role of cell size regulation by autophagy a general phenomenon? Uh, this, uh, this has been reported by, uh, yes, by, um, by other group, uh, uh, by in fact, and, and this group, for example, one of the, one group re reported that uh, uh, the, the metabolism of mevalonate is very important to control cell size. And for example, if you go to the literature, when you inhibit autophagy and you look carefully, for example, in Drosophila work by Eric Berecki, clearly show when you block autophagy, you have an increase in cell size. So there is a, a relationship between uh, between autophagy and cell size. Yeah, this seems to be a quite general phenomenon. And of course, now we wanted to, 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 to understand how autophagy is able to control cell size. Well, we are uh, investigating several, uh, several possibilities on that, yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, we'll end it with that. Uh, hopefully, everyone was able to hear uh, the uh, questions. Um, um, so that concludes our Q&A session. I'd like, to, uh, again, to thank the audience for attending and Dr. Caragno for his engaging presentation. So be on the lookout for an email from Novus with a link to the recorded net, uh, webinar. And uh, this concludes our webinar. Have a great day uh, or evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.